Next up for Migration 2020 is Flying's Editor-in-Chief, Julie Boatman. Hey there, virtual migration. My name is Julie Boatman. I'm Editor-in-Chief with Flying Magazine. You may know me as a writer, pilot, flight instructor, dog mom, bad guitar player, really bad dancer, a pretty decent home cook. But there are a few things that you may not know about me. See, when I was eight, I coached for the NFL in my backyard. Our neighbors had two quasi-regulation uniforms, one for the Rams, one for the Cowboys. My five-year-old brother suited up as a Ram, and his pal Andy next door was a Cowboy, of course. Andy's older brother, Roy, was my age and clearly my coaching nemesis. We laid waste to the bleeding hearts, lilies, hostas, everything that was in the Carver's backyard as, as Roy and I made conflicting calls trying to get our brothers in line. So I never thought of myself as a female football coach, but never occurred to me not to be the coach. Another thing you don't know about me, I could shoot a gun, a 22, and sail a boat before I could drive a car, legally that is. I did both before flying an airplane. And it never occurred to me that any of those things wouldn't be things that a girl would do. I credit my parents and my high achieving public high school friends in Iowa and a certain amount of privilege for sure for cocooning me. But it didn't hit me that I was a minority amongst pilots when I first soloed as a young woman in 1987. I wish I could recapture that innocence. I do sometimes. It normally involves being flying along at less than a thousand feet on a reasonably sunny day, humming along with the engine, whatever song is going through my head. I was encouraged to fly by a family friend and I fell for that view out of the little 150 that I got my private certificate in. I've never stopped loving that, probably the most, followed closely by the sublime beauty of a great crosswind landing. Every airplane has its ambiance. Queen among them is the DC-3, which is why it ranks as probably my favorite if I have to choose from amongst my children. The history just swirls around you as you fly with the sounds, the vibrations, the smells of the earth coming up through the open pilot side window, oil mixed with hydraulic fluid, mixed with you know, the sweat of a hundred pilots who've come before you. Yeah, I tackled my instrument rating while I was still in high school and finished up in the year before college. A brief hiatus ended while I was finishing my degree, getting my CFI along with my bachelor's. I got my multi-engine, my ATP, and each rating was a special challenge that I embraced and that I learned from. People would always ask, so why don't you go to the airlines? I thought about it, honestly. I filled out an application more than once for United. Hey, I was living in Denver and they were one of the hometown airlines. But I never turned it in. I also thought about going corporate, but I never took that plunge either, even after I got typed in the Citation Mustang and had a pretty easy segue into the right seat. You see, after I learned an airplane, I kind of wanted to move on. Instrument flying is interesting and infinitely challenging, and I love teaching the techniques that go into a good approach as much as I love sailing through the tops of the cloud layers. But wearing four stripes on my shoulder just isn't what moves me, though I respect it deeply in other people. Instead, I wanna fly different things, with different people, listen to their stories, and then write about it. This is how I identify as a pilot. I'm not really after hours in my logbook, but experiences. I was already reading flying magazines like AOPA and Private Pilot, Mountain Pilot, and Flight Training, and flying, of course. I gravitated towards the writers that evoke those same sensations in me. And since I've always written, whether it was a diary or soap opera style fiction or cheesy song lyrics, I, I, I sought to model what they were doing. When I took on this job, 
as editor of Flying Magazine. I step into a legacy that I really honor. But I'm no Richard Cummins, as has been pointed out to me, thanks to a couple of readers. No, I'm no Mac or Isabel or Steve. I will never have the same take as anyone who has come before me in this role. For a while, I agonized about that. Should I buy a dude tin? Wax on about the virtues of the latest jets? Take a partnership in a Cirrus? <laughs> Any one of those things would hit an aspect of my pilot self, but not touch the heart of it. Uh, my role models were Lane, Bax, Richard Bach, and on the training side, Bill Kirshner for injecting humor without making me cringe too much, and for teaching me about spins with his star instructor, Catherine Cabanero. And then there's Scott Spangler, who gave me my first break at flight training. His eloquence and power of observation is worth seeking out. And then there's my former editor at Jeppesen, Liz Cayley who could pick apart anything technical and make it make sense. Liz flew for a regional and corporate for a bit, but she really found her stride in curriculum development. If you check your bookshelf and you've got a guided flight discovery text for private instrument, multi or CFI, she was the one with that vision. And she bled red ink all over my first technical writing as a new editor for three years, <laughs> trying to pound good sense into my writing. Thanks, Liz. Maybe it worked. Readers have put a lot of these folks up on a pedestal. And yes, I'm quite sure that Collins could land that 210 just as precisely as Dick Carl says he did in his latest column on the subject. But I'm also sure that no one of them constitutes a perfect image of a flying editor not any more than they could be a perfect pilot. That's elusive for everyone. I was actually mistaken for Lane Wallace once at Sun and Fun around 2005 or so. Lane had just written a column on how she was essentially uninterested in getting her instrument rating, that it didn't really reflect the kind of flying that she liked to do. At the show, I was attending a press event at the media headquarters and an older gentleman came up to me and started reading me the riot act for not having an instrument rating. At the time, not only did I have my double I, but I was actively instructing and making work trips in the Bonanza. So imagine my confusion. <laughs> I told the man he was mistaken and he walked away in a huff. The colleague I was with said, he thought you were lame. Ah. But didn't Lane also have the right not to feel like she had to adhere to this guy's idea of what a pilot should be? Mac didn't speak to me at all until after I owned an airplane. It was like I failed to have shape or form until I held the title to something. And these things, having an instrument rating, owning an airplane, are critical milestones in my own pilot journey, but neither of them define me as a pilot. Right now, I'm in between on instrument currency and in between on airplanes. Neither of those things affects my intrinsic value to myself as an aviator. Do I want them to change? Sure, who wouldn't? But I'm not less than because of it. And by the way, I give you all of this history so that when you inevitably hit some patch in your life that takes away part of who you thought you were, you're gonna be okay. It almost inevitably happens to every one of us, unless we leave this world too early in the prime of our flying. A couple of weeks ago, in pursuit of regaining my formation currency, I rode along as number five in a five ship, with number four being flown by a pilot that I had a lot of respect for. A former Air Force F-15 guy and a chief pilot for a major airline. He was just coming back into flying after a high issue took away his medical certificate for a while. He was fighting that rust, just like I was. And though it's not pretty to work through those struggles, it also goes to show that I didn't think of him as any less of a pilot. So why should I think of myself as such when I've had to take a break or my eyesight changes or I'm distracted by life's events or I just don't have the reflexes that I used to? At some point, the definition that you always carried around about yourself as a pilot won't match up with the reality. It's okay. Your pilot self never was really tied to anything but your love for flying. 
And if you can no longer fly the way you wanted to, you can create a new definition. Or suppose you've been following a path that is more should than want to. Like you should learn to fly a tailwheel airplane, or you should take that regional job, or you should buy this airplane instead of that one because it's more practical. Focus those shoulds on things that will actually help keep you safe as a pilot. Like, I should focus in 2021 on building my proficiency instead of just ticking the box on three landings every 90 days, or a flight review that checks off a standard list of maneuvers but doesn't take you into that juicy stuff. But don't let the shoulds give you just a pilot image to look up to. Spend your precious time doing the flying that brings you joy. So why am I telling you all this again? Well, have a penny, former F-16 pilot and current airman flyer. You might have her for the role she played on 9-11, tasked with taking down United 93 before it could hit the Washington Mall. If you haven't heard her tell that story, that she's just now, 19 years later, sharing, I highly recommend it. Well, Heather called me a couple of months ago, and before I could fangirl all over the place, she asked me to think about an initiative she had in mind to eliminate all the different pathways to being a pilot. Her specific interest was in broadening aviation's appeal to young women, but the call was broader than that. We fell naturally into this conversation because she's no longer flying for the military. And I found a path to professional aviation that never involved any of the usual suspects. Instead, we're both working hard to identify as good, proficient pilots, and that quest is never ending, and making those lights that bring us joy. And speaking of which, I have a few more thoughts, <laughs> but I'm going to leave you for now and hope that you have the very best of flying in 2021. I'd like to give you a song of great social and political import. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a citation tip? My friends all fly phenoms, I must make amends. Worked hard, hard on my logger, no help from my friends. So Lord, won't you buy me a citation tin? Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a bright red RV? Paying for flight time is trying to break me. I'll wait for delivery each day until free. So, Lord, won't you buy me a bright red RV. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a duck at the lawn? I'm counting on you, Lord. Please don't let me down. Prove that you love me and let me spin round. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a duck at the lawn? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a citation tent? My friends all fly phenoms, I must make amends. Worked hard on my longboard, no help from my friends. So Lord, won't you buy me a citation tent? That's it.